and welcome to Emerge the Radio Show. I'm Dorothea Schuler, and we're so glad you're joining us. On this week's show, we'll be speaking with Christy Wells, co founder of Safe House Project, and Iris Wright, the founder and CEO of Caring Hearts Coaching and Consulting. Of course, a little later, we'll be making a divine decision with me, Dorothea. Then, Deshana drops some jewels as she gives us her two cents on finance. But first up, like we always do around this time, we get to hear some amazing tips from Tiffany to help you emerge as a CEO. So come on, let's go and tiptoe over with Tiffany into the CEO's Corner. Emerge, emerge yourself. I'm Tiffany Boyle, and thank you for tiptoeing into my CEO corner. Okay, everybody, has anyone else find it hard to stay fit and fabulous? Also, why running a business, maybe having a full-time job, and or being a parent. I know I do, but I also know it is important. Our health, how we feel, how we look, those are all important. The answer is balance. Sounds simple, right? One word, balance. But it's not easy to balance life, fitness, and work. My suggestions are to create a schedule, not just a schedule, but a reasonable one. One that will actually fit your lifestyle. In that schedule, you have to carve out time to work out, eat a balanced diet. I figured out I can cook every other day, pack my lunch, and have trail mix in the car and in my office so I don't eat out as much. That is my trick. Keep your workout schedule while traveling, and believe me, that is a tough one for me. So busy CEOs, bosses, and entrepreneurs, all I'm saying is find time to be fit and fab. And I'm Tiffany Boyle, and that's my tip from the CEO Corner. Hello, you are tuned into the Emerge Radio Show. I am your host, Deshana Kemp Garnett, along with our co-host, Dorothea Schuler. And today we are in for a treat because we have Miss Christy, the CEO of Safe House Project. Christy, how are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. So Christy, talk to us about the Safe House Project. Yeah, so Safe House Project is a national anti-trafficking organization that it myself and Brittany Dunn co-founded back in 2017. I can't believe it's been that long. We are both, uh, my husband just retired, but when we launched it, we were both military spouses. Her husband is still active duty and we came from varying backgrounds in corporate America and had thriving careers of our own. And we were not looking to respond to an international issue uh, and an issue that was plaguing our communities. But in 2017, we saw a need to develop a, a national organization to address human trafficking here in America. And so we are a national organization that combats trafficking by increasing victim identification through education, helping survivors escape their trafficking situation and get them placed into safe homes. And then we help fund, mentor, and launch new safe homes across America for survivors of trafficking to receive residential services and restorative care. Christy, wow. you said a mouthful. <laughs> a <laughs> Just whole lot. Yes. And I have a lot of questions. I think okay. my first question is, what is there something like a pinnacle event or something that happened in 2017 where you and Brittany decided, okay, we have to do this? Yes, there was. So both of us had seen trafficking internationally and Brittany had actually worked more than I had in combating trafficking or really working in the restorative care space as a volunteer domestically. But in 2017, a dear friend of ours, who's a Christian hip hop artist, had gone to South Africa and seen a need to build up a safe house to protect girls that were at risk of trafficking. He came back hard on fire. He'd seen something he just couldn't unsee, something that Brittany and I were all too familiar with. He launched an album with a bunch of Grammy artists to raise money to build up the safe house in South Africa. Well, my background is marketing and advertising and PR. So I jumped in to run the launch of the album just to help him out, which was hilarious because I had a number of people go, you do know you're white, right? Um, But he just, he said, Hey, look, I want your help and we're going to run this. And um, so help launch this album. And as we started doing that, people started to say, that's great, but what are you going to do here? And Nigel turned to me and said, Hey, look, I think you and Brittany really 
need to make this a domestic issue and a national focus nationally. And so we really took time to become students of the industry to understand what was happening with the trafficking landscape in America and what we could do as military spouses who moved all the time with corporate America backgrounds. But we really dug into the issue of trafficking. And once we saw the statistics and really a, a few key gaps, then we knew where we had to serve. Yeah, I have to admit, this is definitely the most compelling interview that I've gotten to listen to thus far, because you hear about, you see, and you do actually know that human trafficking is real. You see it on the news, you see the stories, you hear the stories, but to actually be talking with someone who says, hey, myself and my co-founder actually experienced it in different ways. And then with being overseas and seeing it, and then just you telling the story of your friend who's the artist, just hearing that story gave me conviction about the way you said he couldn't unsee what he saw. It's Mm -hmm. like just speaking to you and hearing about this, I can't even unhear what I've heard. And so as Deshana was saying, you know, just how you guys got into this, just trying to find out the pinnacle. It just, just this conversation has brought me deeper to where I feel like, wow, what can I do to support you guys? And also I noticed that you said he was a hip hop artist. You mentioned how he went about raising funds. You talked about how you partnered with him. And it's amazing because this show is all about entrepreneurship and you just spoke to so many different areas, the marketing, the partnership, the actual doing, the project. So could you just tell me about how you have experienced in all those areas? areas and how you guys are able to pull that all in? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think what's been really beautiful about this has been um, for each person that helped launch this organization, that for Nigel, the hip hop artist, myself, Brittany, um, what we did was we said, what are the tools in my hands? What are the things that I am good at? And how can I apply these to the need? Because so many people, they don't step into combating something because they go, gosh, I'm not a social worker. I'm not a therapist. I'm I'm not equipped to do this. And it becomes a barrier to saying yes. And to us, we said, look, I, I don't I don't know anything about being a social worker or being a therapist or doing these things. But I said, I do know marketing and I do know advertising. And I did fashion PR in London for a bunch of fashion designers. I'm sure I can figure out how to do PR for an album launch. Sure. Right, exactly. Put that dissimilar. And when I, um, when we had to found the organization and really develop the business plan, Brittany was on maternity leave. So when I tell you, so there was a third gal who also was helping us launch. So we had three husbands deployed and seven children under the age of seven when we launched this organization. So let's be clear, we ain't normal. But oh, we, right. Brittany was on I, I maternity only have two, leave. But it feels like 14, but you right? know, more power <laughs> to y'all. <laughs> oh, I, I feel that. But we, um, but Brittany was husband was deployed. She had a, a newborn baby. So she was on maternity leave. And, but her background, she was, she was an MBA. So she said, look, look, I'll help you write a business plan. And so it just, it all started spiraling with people saying, what are the tools in my hands? What is the need? And how can I apply my skill sets uniquely to serve? And that is how this organization has been built on Wash, Rinse, Repeat from people across the nation. I don't know if you caught that, Dorothea, but we need to all, when we're thinking about starting a new business, we need to realize what tool set do we have? Because I feel like a lot of people, they have the idea and for whatever reason, they get hindered thinking about the things they don't have and they don't know. Know, instead mm-hmm. of just thinking about what do I have that I can use to move forward, the other stuff will come as long as you use what you already have. So I think you put touched on something really good there. Oh my goodness. Yes, Deshaina, I was definitely catching the jewels. She was dropping absolutely like, you know, when she was saying what tools I have in my hand and coming together. And then when you even said there was a third person that just kind of struck my heart, just sitting here listening to you has just been awesome because it's that coaching, it's that advice, that wisdom that you get from other other entrepreneurs when you have these conversations and you get to talk and people get to learn you not just that bringing awareness to what you guys are doing like the safe house project it's just unbelievable so we definitely want to hear more and if you're just tuning in this is Dorothea Schuler and I'm here with co-host Deshana Kemp Garnett we have with us Christy from the safe house project and she's just been telling us all about just how they began what they're about what they're doing and so just continue continue to give us some more information. She was just uh, telling us about how everyone put their hands together and brought their talents to a greater purpose.
Yeah, absolutely. So for us, you know, from a business standpoint, I think the other thing is always making sure that you are not replicating what's already been out there. So us becoming students to understand what was already out there was pivotal because we said, look, we're half crazy already for launching a national organization as three military spouses with husbands deployed with corporate background. Like there is nothing about this that says we're going to succeed. So if we're going to do it, we're going to do something that nobody else is already doing and make sure that we're filling a gap. And so that was so essential. So for us, what we saw at that time was Department of Justice was reporting um, about 300,000 American kids are trafficked in the United States every year, are being sold for sex, um, but only 1% of them are being identified. And once those kiddos are identified, if they don't have a safe place to heal, 80% will end up back in trackers' hands. And in 2017, there were only 100 beds in safe homes where they could heal across America. That's it. I'm so Sorry, Christy. Could you repeat those statistics again? Numbers definitely paint a picture. And as I said, this is one of the most important interviews we've ever had. Could you repeat the number of people in trafficking? And you just go back over those numbers again. I'm astonished. Yeah. yeah. So this was a report that the Department of Justice issued in 2017. They've since rescinded this report because trafficking is an illegal industry. It's difficult to track. But at that time, they estimated 300,000 American kids trafficked in the United States every year for sex. Only 1% of them were ever being identified um, by law enforcement or ever escaping their trafficking situation. So you think of 300,000, we've got 3,000 kids that are being identified as sex trafficking victims that are then being offered services. But if the effective services aren't in place, and let's say a kid is pulled out of a trafficking situation and is thrown into foster care or is thrown into a juvenile detention center or is thrown into a mental health institution, which was largely what was happening at that time. If they don't receive the right services, which those are not the right services, 80% of that 1% will be re-victimized. And so what is the right place for them to go is what's called a safe home. And that is a residential home, residential program, where usually, let's say if it's for uh, minor girls, um, it's usually you know four to six girls living in a home. They have therapy, they have counselors, they have education, they have life skills training. They have all of these services wrapping around them to help them heal. And that's when they have a chance to rebuild their life, rebuild their identity to um, establish healthy boundaries. I mean, up to 40 to 60 percent, depending on the area in the United States of these kiddos are trafficked and sold for sex by family members. And so establishing healthy boundaries is so pivotal. So if they didn't have this, 80 percent would be revictimized. So for us, we recognized that there was a need to increase identification through true education. We recognized there was a need to connect survivors with services when, once they exited their trafficking situation. And we recognized that there was a need to help build more safe homes. And so those were the three areas that we focused where we could not just create something new, but build upon what was already there in order to strengthen the anti-trafficking movement nationwide. Wow. Um, that is amazing work that you're doing just as far as your heart. Number two, it is so strategic as far as the different things that you're covering and the awareness, information, the education, I'm guessing the training, the resources that have to be put into it, the organization of the operations of business that go into this. So I'm I'm sure you're a 501c3. Mm -hmm, we are. I would definitely hope so. Mm -hmm. Are there grants? Is there a lot of support out there as far as the government, you know, laws, different things being passed to give you access to capital, to funds, to opportunities for grants, for assistance? What is your experience in that area and what could be done differently or more? Yeah, so we have personally, by and large, been funded by private donors, private grants, private foundations for the last five years. Um, it was actually only in the last couple of months that we... Um, applied for and received uh, what's basically federal dollars that have been trickled down to state distribution. So um, we have not historically gone after those federal dollars um, or even those state dollars because typically we want the local programs to be able to access those themselves and it makes more sense for them to do it. So we come in with a lot of the other safe homes across the United States and when they need funding to sometimes the government will require X percent of funding uh, to the organization that, you know, maybe it's a 10% and then the government will fund the other 90%. But we will come in as that kind of match on that side in order for our partners to access those federal funds. 
we just helped with a piece of legislation a couple months ago that just got signed by the president and it reenacted some trafficking, anti-trafficking legislation across the U.S., but ultimately it funded an additional $1.6 billion in federal funding to combat uh, for domestic and international initiatives to combat trafficking. Um, of that, I think $39 million was allocated towards safe housing. And then there's other initiatives, funding task forces and those kind of things. And so the dollars are out there. The fact is right now we're operating with $1.6 billion over five years. So we're looking at millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. The fact is we need more. I mean, this is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world, second only to guns and, um, and drugs. And so we have to have a comprehensive response to solve a complex issue. And funding is a big piece of that. And there's um, the prioritization has not been there so far with the government, but we are working on a lot of different pieces of legislation to advance that forward. Well, I know you and Brittany must be extremely busy. Um, but speaking of resources, and you said private donors, if we have you know listeners who want to get involved with Safe House Project or want to support, what all do you need and how can they support this effort? Yeah, well, it costs on average $1,000 to help a survivor exit their trafficking situation. We served 57 last month. And so dollars are always pivotal because those cover hotels, those cover airfare for us to get them out on emergency flight, those cover Ubers, they cover those emergency supplies, right? As somebody is exiting their trafficking situation, sometimes they're leaving with nothing but the clothes on their back. And so we work to resource them immediately. Um, it's sometimes their first warm meal that we, you know, Uber eats to them in a hotel for their first night of safety. And so all of those things that we do just to make them comfortable and feel safe and seen and known and loved usually rolls up to about a thousand dollars. And so if you and 10 girlfriends want to get together and do that and sponsor one of our survivor escapes, then we would love that. Um, so that's a huge part of what we need. Obviously, we need support as we continue to build up the safe homes. But I think that is probably one of the most tangible needs. You know, again, $50 covers that first Uber, $100 covers that first night's sleep, um, $30 covers that first meal. So those are great things that people can do and just donate at safehouseproject.org slash donate. And those dollars go towards making a tremendous difference and making survivors seen, again, known, seen, and loved. Thank you so much. I mean, you never even know how much money, how little or how much impact you think of every time you want to support something. Like, oh my gosh, it costs this astronomical figure. But you know, $30 and $50, $100 goes a long way. So I'm so glad that you shared that with us. Now, if people want to learn more about Safe House Project in general, could you give us that website again? Or do you all have any type of social media that we can follow just to stay in the loop. Yeah, we have our website, which is safehouseproject.org. There's a lot of information on our website. We've got great social media on all of the standard channels, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, so definitely follow us there. Our LinkedIn for our business professionals is really well built out. And so definitely follow us there because you'll get a different type of content. And then if you want to understand how you can be a part of the solution to combat trafficking, I really encourage everybody to take the step of taking our training at IamOnWatch.org. And that is a one hour training. That's all it takes. And that will equip you to, again, understand what trafficking looks like in our communities. And that's so pivotal because that's how we can really be those eyes and ears and make sure that we are looking out for the vulnerable kids in our communities. Absolutely. You gave me an idea there when you were saying girlfriends get together. Shana knows how we do. We definitely get together. And I was thinking in my head, you know, how would you converse or talk about that. And you just said there's an hour long I am training. I'm just in visualizing, hey, having some girlfriends over. We are watching the training, eating, talking about it. And then we just go in our purses like we do when we want those shoes, those bags, when we want to go and have that brunch and say, hey, like she said, it takes so much money, whether the amount too small or too much, it doesn't matter. It's that effort. And I would just love to do that. So thanks for giving that first creative idea and then letting people know where they can go and actually be trained. And an hour is not a long time. We binge watch Netflix and things all the time. So awesome. Okay, Christy. So this is our very last question and it is our signature question. And that is, what does the word emerge mean to you? Mm, you know, for me, I, I would say I'm not even going to reckon it to, to myself or what, you know, that is meant for me. But I'd say I, I hear that and I think of the survivors that we serve emerging out of health with such bravery and such strength and they step 
into freedom and they start to discover freedom on their own. And so it is um, when a survivor emerges, um, it is the most beautiful thing to me. Out of all the definitions I've heard, I feel like that has been the most beautiful and the most where it really hit home and it makes sense. So I'm so appreciative of you for sharing your definition of what the word emerge means to you. Of course. Thank you, ladies. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you so much to you and Brittany for putting this project together and for, you know, doing what you can to serve the community it is very noble. Well, yes. thank you ladies so much. I'm so grateful to be on and appreciate just you giving us an opportunity to talk about the work and the survivors that we serve. Yes. Thank you so much, Christy, and best of luck, prayers and wishes to you and Brittany as you guys continue to emerge to help these survivors. Thank you so much. Tom has been a teacher for over 40 years. One day, I think one of the students had asked the question and he didn't remember the answer. And I also noticed that he was letting his class out earlier than they were supposed to let out. I was really starting to worry. Levi and I talked about how it would change our lives, but he was there beside me. When something feels different, it could be Alzheimer's. Now is the time to talk. Visit alz.org slash our stories to learn more. A message from the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. Some of the best sounds you'll ever hear are generic, safe, effective, even money-saving, just like FDA-approved generic drugs. Even if they don't come in the exact same color or shape as their brand name equivalents, they have the same key ingredients and go through a rigorous review process. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist today and visit fda.gov slash generic drugs. Generics are safe, effective, and can save you money. You'll like the sound of that. Adopt US Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting A Teenager Learning the Lingo GOAT G O A T acronym stands for greatest of all time as in spaghetti sandwiches for dinner they're my fave dad you're the goat You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same visit adoptuskids.org brought to you by the US Department of Health and Human Services Adopt US Kids and the Ad Council If you came across someone struggling with hunger how would you recognize them Would you notice an 8-year-old girl who's, who's not, not excited, excited for, for summer, summer break because she may not be having lunch again until September or a war veteran who's, who's having, having a hard, hard time, time landing, landing a job and getting back on his feet I am the one in 8 Americans who struggle with hunger I am hunger in America Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Unlike other health concerns, mental illness is not always easy to see. Depression won't show up on an eye chart, and you can't measure it on your bathroom scale. Sorting out a mental health concern is not something to attempt on your own. You won't find a bipolar disorder by looking at a thermometer. Like many other health conditions, help for mental illness takes professional diagnosis and treatment. Anxiety won't just go away under a stick-on bandage. So the sooner you seek treatment, the better. If you or a loved one has a mental health concern, don't go it alone. Find out what to do. For 24-hour free and confidential information and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Learn more at samhsa.gov slash support. That's S-A-M-H-S-A dot gov slash support. It's Emerge Wednesdays on WHOV 88.1 FM. Welcome back. I'm Dorothea Schuler, and you're listening to Emerge the Radio Show, the show that's all about entrepreneurs and business and is the premier information source for business owners. If you're just now joining us, Deshana and myself just spoke with Christy Wells, co-founder of Safe House Project, a nonprofit organization whose vision is to unite communities to end domestic sex trafficking and restore hope and freedom to every survivor. Their mission is to increase survivor identification beyond 1% through education, through providing emergency services and placement to survivors, and ensuring they have access to safe housing and holistic care nationwide. 
It was definitely one of the most profound and important interviews we've ever had. So if you miss Christie's interview, it's not only imperative that you educate yourself, but you can also see how you can help. So to do so, please visit EmergeTheMagazine.com where you can also find any of our previous shows. All right. The reality is we all operate throughout the course of our lives based on a series of decisions. A decision is a conclusion or resolution reached after consideration. And divine means excellence. So we're making an excellent choice. With that being said, let's make the divine decision today to grow. I won't pain you this week with the definition of the word grow. We all know and recognize the perception of growth, but the word grow is such a generalized term. So if it's so general, why did I choose it for this week's divine decision? How many of us know that just because you're six foot six doesn't mean you're headed to the NBA, but that's perception. Another example, just because you're speaking to an adult doesn't mean you're guaranteed to have a mature conversation. I want to specify growth as it pertains to gain. So I'm talking about growing from where you currently are and on to the next step of your progression. Now, only you can make the decision on how much you will grow. Honestly, sometimes our self-evaluations are self-destructing. Last week, we just spoke about the decision to evaluate ourselves. Now, we want to be honest and firm when evaluating ourselves, but let's also be fair and give a little grace. It's hard to grow when we feel discouraged or scared to take the next step. It's like a baby learning to walk, the bird whose mother shoved it out the nest, or even the child who's riding their bike for the first time without the training wheels. We can stifle our own growth due to discouragement and fear. No, we can't always determine the magnitude of growth, but if we take that step, whether it be physically, mentally, or spiritually, we can determine the atmosphere and process for that growth to be possible. We can decide to grow from a small bulb into a beautiful rose, from a bush into a tree. We can decide to grow from mediocrity into excellence. We just have to set our minds to do so. I'll leave you with this statement. It's my best line for you today. And of course, from my favorite book, the Bible, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. So today, join me. Let's take off into a new direction and let's emerge together into our best life and make the divine decision to grow. Knowing this decision will ultimately help to shape and create a path that reflects a light of excellence in our lives. This, my friends, has been another divine decision with Dorothea. You can decide to be a part of Emerge the Radio Show by submitting your response to our signature question. What does the word emerge mean to you? Share that with us on our IG at Emerge the Magazine. This week's response is from Linnea Blizzard, who works in finance and is from Windsor, Virginia. Emerge means grow, stimulate, flower, flourish, rebirth. Wow, how simple, but so definitive and strong. Thanks, Linnea. May we all flourish and have a rebirth on the way to our emergence. You can follow Linnea on Instagram at Dame Blizzard 1998. That's D A M E B L I S Z Z A R D 1998. Thanks for listening to the Emerge Radio Show. Up next, we'll be speaking with Iris Wright, founder and CEO of Caring Hearts Coaching and Consulting, where they provide businesses with coaching and consulting to assist with helping them build their. Their passion into their business. Emerge, emerge it's Emerge Wednesdays on WHOV 88.1 FM. Hello, if you are just tuning in, you are listening to the Emerge Radio Show. I am your host, Deshana Kemp Garnett, along with co-host Miss Dorothea Schuler. And today we are super excited because we have Iris right in the building. Welcome, Iris. Welcome, guys. All right, so Iris, you know, we're already talking about it. We got to let the people know you are a serial entrepreneur. So number one, explain to that, us what that is and talk to us about all the amazing business ventures you have going right now. A serial entrepreneur is basically we have different companies and we do a lot of different things in the community um, and different businesses. 
you guys do different businesses throughout the community. So are the different businesses you own all located centrally? Where are you located as far as that? We're located in Newport News, but we kind of, we handle all over Hampton Roads. And in some particular businesses, we work all 50 states. Nice. And Caring Heart, how did you come up with that title? I'm hearing a little bit already. I heard you say community. So just talk to us a little bit about how you just emerged from one business as to another and how you came about the name. Just tell us your story. <laughs> Well, I guess I'll start from the beginning. Before the pandemic, I was unhappy with what I was doing, working in the healthcare field. It was still, you know, some time getting used to. I ended up reading Steve Harvey's book, Jump, and I kind of quit my job. <laughs> Um, you said and, jump? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I just went ahead and um, gave my two weeks notice and quit my job. I opened up Rights Virtual Services. I basically put everything in there to create multiple streams of income, things that I knew how to do that I was already doing on the side. You know, I've been a tax preparer since I've been 16, 17 years old. I've been doing taxes, took the classes and the training. So I just uh, went through the IRS and got my EFIN and credentials from them, got my software, started doing taxes. We have a remote call center and we got about 40 companies that we do customer service for. So I had people working with that. I was a notary and did title work. So I just added that in there. I kind of added multiple streams of income and it kind of happened at a good time, I would say, because in the pandemic hit. And then um, once we got that going um, good and through the pandemic, it helped me prepare for Karen Hearts. So at first we were called Karen Hearts Senior Living. We opened January of 2021. We home health care and um, we ended up taking Medicaid insurance is why I ended up restructuring and changing everything up. Um, I didn't like the Medicaid system and just revamped. And then we reopened this this last August of 2022. But I wanted to change the dynamics. So it wasn't just the Medicaid system that we've seen a problem with. We've seen a problem with a lot of our clients not getting the proper care from loved ones and or having the support system. So even if we had an aid in the house, when we leave, it nothing else happens. They stop taking their medications. They're not always checking their blood sugars. We find out later on while they're in the hospital what's going on. So I wanted to be able to help those people that couldn't afford to get 24-hour care, figure out a way to you know fix that gap in between that we can still take care of them. And then during COVID, you know, of course, a lot of AIDS, CNAs, um, people were quitting, calling out. They didn't want to work. They were scared. So that left a lot of seniors without care. So I, I wanted to create something that I felt was needed. So when we reopened, we reopened with some technology. I think I'm the only virtual and hybrid home care company. And we shut down the senior living and we restructured into Karen Hart's telecare. Telecare, we have virtual home care. We provide them the technology. We teach seniors how to use their mobile devices. And we handle all of their medication, monitor all their doctor's appointments, transportation. We partner with a pharmacy. So we handle their pharmacy as well. We also partner with a skilled company because we're pretty much companion right now. So we kind of ha have the alerts going to through their mobile phone, but we also have remote CNAs that work on the back end. So they're still getting that personal touch over top of the technology to make sure things are getting done. So we're verifying. So even if they have a companion in our house making meals and doing things for them when the companion leaves we're still in the virtual world so they're still getting 24-hour care at a much affordable cost all right, and, let me stop you there yeah Iris, i have so many questions yeah <laughs> <laughs> you said a mouthful okay first off this is a statement not a question karen hearts just in what you explained about your businesses right yeah. i know you have to have a passion and a true caring heart to do what you do i never even knew that some of these services Services that you're talking about providing, like who would have thought to say, hey, let's offer this virtually. That is super <laughs> awesome. I wish I had known that because I would hire you because, you know, my mom has a smartphone. She has no idea how to use it. And, you know, somebody help her <laughs> with a smartphone would have been amazing. I just can't believe, like, how do you find the time for all these different business ventures? I don't do everything on my own. I'm an outside of the box type of person. I like to put things together. I'll help execute it. And then I'll hire people to do everything else. <laughs> but um, with Karen Hart's Telecare, we have staff. So the staff pretty much takes care of everything. I still do a little bit on the side. I handle scheduling and payroll, but I also have virtual assistants too that help me on the back end of things. And that's the same thing with rights. 
We have people working in the call center in all states. Next year, we have a tax team coming in. So we'll have 15 additional people added on our team for next tax season. Then we actually have a tax class that's going to be attached to that. So, you know, it's not just one person doing everything. I don't believe in solely working your business. I think you got to be outside the box so you can see everything. I definitely agree. So what type of, what do you have planned for 2023? I turned 40 this year and I went through a situation when I was 18 years old. I was facing over 20 years incarceration. I lost my daughter. It took me five years to get her back for a crime I didn't commit, which I never speak about. A lot of people um, didn't know that about me. I didn't even know that I was going to speak about it ever. So I kind of burned things up and everything. I had to go to the courts and get copies of things again. But um, I decided to come out in January and talk about my story to share it. I wrote a book, which is going to be coming out in July, uh, my solo book. But in the middle of doing that, I had supported some other women. They was doing anthologies. So I've been writing. So I decided to be the visionary of an anthology called Injustice. We do our live launch on May the 20th. I have other authors in that book with me telling their stories. So I kind of wanted to make a movement from it and I wanted to, you know, just raise awareness. I decided to take something that was negatively impacting me all of these years, 21 years that I was embarrassed of. I decided to not let it own me. I wanted to take ownership and my power back. So I decided to come out and talk about it. And hopefully we can make some impact in the community if we continue to just talk about it and let people hear what we went through, not just with the charges and the court system, but also mentally. Because a lot of people, you know, now that I came out and talk about it at the beginning, you think you're by yourself. And then every day people inboxing me, thanking me and talking to me about their experience and what happened to them. So it's been healing. Iris, I just want to thank you for sharing that with us. If you are just now joining us, this is the Emerge Radio Show. I'm Dorothea Schuler, and I'm here with co-host Deshana Kemp Garnett. And we have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Iris Wright. She has just really taken the show today full circle in ways we didn't even imagine. I know Deshana said she was like a mouthful. I'm overwhelmed. You've got an author here. You have a tax preparer here. You have the owner of a company that provides to over 40 different companies like virtual assistant business and um, I guess services. You yourself also run and coordinate a home health care service. And that came from a passion. I understand and then the story you just shared is just compelling that you were facing incarceration and that you lost custody of your daughter and just hearing these things and also hearing the double-edged sword of the excellence and how you have emerged through life to become just an exceptional person a boss for sure, entrepreneurial, serial entrepreneur. Some people say they own businesses, but you are literally creating, running them, implementing them. And just all the jewels you've dropped is unbelievable. So Iris, I feel like when I get off, I'm going to go and like nominate your business for the Emerge Award 2023, because you are exactly what this show is all about. This is just like been an amazing interview so far, but we're definitely not done. Can you <laughs> tell us just, yeah, because there's so much I want to <laughs> ask. Can you tell us actually foundationally when you went to set these businesses up? Because you mentioned that you read a book, you were inspired, you quit your job, you paid attention to things that were happening in the pandemic and said, how can I meet the need? But who helped you? I mean, I hear what you're saying, but did you like reach out to a business development agency? I know you talked about some experience it's like, what did you do? How did you go about doing that as far as other people who are at work and maybe tomorrow want to go, I'm walking off. <laughs> you give some of those people advice. Well, um, I didn't really have any help. So I just researched. Everything's pretty much online. You know, even with the home care, I wrote every policy. I made every form. I used to wake up at two to five in the morning was the time that I would write all my policies and get things together for licensing. And, as, you know, and as we restructure, I'm doing the same thing now. Wake up early while the baby's in sleep and get my, my things done for the state and all that kind of stuff. And I just researched and just followed along. I attended 
related networking events, Black Brand for one. I do a lot with them to learn any type of state events that was going on about entrepreneurship. I know before the pandemic got here, the woman owned business center. I used to live in there at the beginning, you know, to educate myself, utilizing the tools that I had. Of course, with everything, you have trial and error and say, okay, I got this. I, I see where I made a mistake at. Let me fix it. That's the process. I'm big on researching and looking into things. Even when I wanted to become virtual, I interviewed and demoed a million technology companies, talking to them about what my expectations are and what I was looking for um, and all that good stuff. And, you know, we started out using a third party. We currently still use a third party, but as of May, we'll have our own platform so we don't have to pay someone else to use their platform and we can really utilize it to the level that I want to utilize it for. But I did everything pretty much by myself. Even the foundation, we got Karen Hart's foundation. We just got our 501c3 in September. I did all that by myself and I'm doing the trainings for it. I'm in nonprofit classes and everything. I'm learning how to make sure everything is right because nonprofit is something else. I have to make sure I have things in order, you know. I did do all that myself. We just launched a program called Adopt a Care Senior Program. So we actually have seniors on our website, seahartsfoundation.org, that are ready to be adopted. We had some clients that have been adopted. How I find clients that need to be adopted, I have six independent senior communities that I go into. And I decided this year that we were going to do lunch and learns. And I was going to teach them how to use their mobile phone so they can be comfortable with technology because that's the way the world is coming. I ended up getting one of the ladies that have an apartment in that complex walk me around to different seniors in her building. And we came across a man. He has cancer. So he was under chemo. He's very weak. His apartment was real, real bad and he couldn't get any help because, you know, we can't send staff in there under those conditions. So I ended up speaking with him, helping him. We adopted him on that Thursday, Friday, a company, which I want to shout out, Love Thy Neighbor, Michelle Tenner, paid $500 and adopted him. The very next day, I was able to get a cleaning crew in there to clean the apartment from top to bottom. I got someone in there to do the carpet. We got grocery shopping done. We made sure all his laundry was washed, called another agency that accepts Medicaid that do more hands-on. They're in there. They're getting his Medicaid and stuff um, taken care of so he can have an aid in there. He told us he fell twice. So we also got my rep from Skill to take over to get him some services. I'm hoping that people can see the benefits of that program and really support so we can help more seniors in our community. You are absolutely amazing. I, I just want to stand up and give you a standing ovation. Like what you do is so near and dear to my heart. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for just seeing a need and feeling the need. Yeah. Because I feel like at most times that's what entrepreneurship is all about. You see a need and you feel a need. And even if it's something that someone else is doing, you put your spin on it and you make it your own. So thank you so much for what you're doing in the community. Thank you. I mean, it's my passion. When I got into the medical field, uh, which was not easy because I took a big pay cut from what I was doing before. I used to run for McDonald's and I was a district supervisor. So when I got into the medical field, my daughter kind of needed me as a teenager. She needed me to be home more. And I ended up going working at PRN at a nursing home. Um, it was a lady. She was 104 years old. And every time I came in three days in a row, she was sick. I can see her declining slowly. And I kept telling the nurses like, hey, she needs a doctor. Something's going on. They said they'll get a doctor the next day same thing. Oh, I forgot. I'll get the doctor. Third day, the doctor happened to be in the building when I went up to the nurse and her pulse ox was at 60. Like, can you go take her pulse ox for me? So that's we had 60. And um, he said, oh, we got to get her out of here. We got to get her cleaned up and get her in the hospital. So when I was getting her cleaned up um, and situated so we could get her to the hospital, the lady grabbed my hand and she looked at me and said, what did I do so bad to live this long? You know, why am I being punished? So that kind of sticks with me through this healthcare journey. Even with fighting for the reimbursement rate for Medicaid, I was very upset that the Medicaid system have benefits for people and they don't utilize it correctly. They don't pay enough for home care. I feel like they don't know how important our jobs are. And I know when I first opened, their rate was at $14.31. Now it's at $18.51. 
I think that it's just so many people really don't think about or consider that until they're either on the other side of the pay or they're at the same time having to deal with what they provide, what they don't provide, what they'll cover. And so just agencies like you and then personally, because it sounds like you're mixing just community efforts as well as what you provide as a business. And then you're also creating nonprofit opportunity, you know, through your business to help these people. There are people that I know would like to get in contact with you. So Iris, can you share with us how people can get in contact with you, where they can follow you, where they can go? Yes, they can contact me at my uh, office number is 757-782-2129. They can go to our website, um, chtelecare.com. I'm on social media, Iris Wright or author Iris Wright or all my companies are on social media. <laughs> we on Instagram, we on LinkedIn. Um, so they can contact me anyway, or they can go to our website and it's a form on there. They can complete and I can call them back. Our website for Karen Hearts Telecare is chtelecare.com. And for Karen Hearts Foundation is chearts, H-E-A-R-T-S, foundation.org. Awesome. So we do have one last question before we go, and that is our signature question. And that is, what does the word emerge mean to you? It means growth, evolve is words that I come that I use a lot. Building, that's kind of the words I, when I think about emerge. And with all of your businesses, Ms. Iris, you have done just that. It has been such a pleasure learning about serial entrepreneurship and just listening to your story and just learning what you do to serve the community. Thank you so very much for being our guest. Thank you. Yes, it's been a pleasure, Iris. And I'm sure we'll see more about Caring Hearts in the future. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Emerge, emerge yourself. If you came across someone struggling with hunger, how would you recognize them? Would you notice a 16-year-old boy who got got his first job, job, not for extra spending money, but to help feed his little sisters? Or a mother who's in between jobs and sometimes goes to bed hungry so her kids can have dinner? I am the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. I I am am hunger hunger in America. America. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Come to the Hampton University Museum and Archive. Free and open to the public, travel back in time and enjoy the masterpieces from the 19th century, the Harlem Renaissance, and even contemporary movements such as Africobra. We are home to the largest public collection of African-American art. You can also admire the museum's special gems like the Liberty Pin, used by Abraham Lincoln to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. Founded in 1868, we're the country's oldest African-American museum. Explore our 10 galleries of fine art from Pacific Islander to African to Native American. We also welcome students and educators to find over 10 million primary documents and photographs for curriculum research. We take pride in our national treasure and hope you do too. Call 757-727-5308 or visit museum at hamptonu.edu for more information and events. Keeping you informed, we are the essence of HU 88.1 WHO. My mother was always very active and independent and she was familiar with her neighborhood. But one day she stopped at the stop sign for much longer than usual. She wasn't even really sure where she was at. It's important for you to talk to someone about it. I felt so much better after my son told me, Mom, we'll figure it out. When something feels different, it could be Alzheimer's. Now is the time to talk. Visit alz.org slash our stories to learn more. A message from the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. Over the past few years, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected how we live our daily lives. Today, we also face a mental health pandemic that threatens our well-being as we attempt to rebuild our social networks and communities. The pandemic has reminded us to value family, community, and our human connections. However, it has also left many of us feeling more isolated, confused, and alone, struggling to find meaning amid loss and uncertainty. Today, one in five Americans experience emotional and mental health challenges, but many of us do not understand what we are facing or know how to ask for help. 
At the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, we understand what you are going through, and we are here to help. Our vision is to build a mentally healthy nation for all. We work every day to eliminate stigma, combat mental illness and substance use disorders, and advance mental health. If you or someone you love needs help, you are not alone. Please visit mentallyhealthynation.org to learn more. You're listening to the Emerge Radio Show on WHOV 88.1 FM. I am Deshana Kemp Garnett, and it's time for my two cents. Hello and happy Wednesday. I am so excited to be here yet again to share with you my two cents. If you've noticed, I love to share what national month it is, what the national day is, just to keep you aware of what's going on and things you can be doing in a certain month. Today is not going to be any different. We are going to talk about what else can we observe for March. March is National Credit Education Month, and that means a lot to our personal finances as well as our business finances. I did a lot of research on this, but I found some great things on a website called clover.com and it really just talks about what we can do for National Credit Education Month. Number one, we need to focus on cleaning up our finances. I feel like I talk about this often, but it's super important. You have to stay on top of where you are. You have to know where you are and that leads right into another tip. Fix your credit scores. Pull your credit report. Know where you are. Your personal finance can affect your business finances. So you need to understand what your credit score is and what what you need to fix. Another thing we always need to be focusing on is reducing our debt. That is something that is major. We need to reduce our debt. So just make sure that you have an understanding of what you can be doing to stay on top of your finances, stay on top of what your credit is looking like. The average U.S. household carries over $7,000 in revolving credit card debt. On average, Americans collectively hold over $14.3 trillion in consumer debt. That is a lot of debt. That's a lot of money. So as business owners, we need to know where we stand because we are in the business to make money. As we make money, we can do better with our own personal finances. So I'm going to encourage each of you to get educated on where you stand with your credit in the month of March. I am Deshana Kemp Garnett, and that's my two cents. Here's what's coming up in Hampton Roads. Let's take a look at some local local and regional activities. Do you know someone 17 years old or younger that owned and operated a business in 2022? Well, I have some great news for you. Emerge has opened a new category for the Emerge Gala and Business Awards for youth entrepreneurs. Nominations are open until March 12th. Visit EmergePremier.com to submit your nomination for a youth entrepreneur. A special thank you for the guests on today's show. To listen to past episodes, visit Emerge the Magazine You've been listening to the Emerge Radio Show. All opinions expressed on this show are that of our guests and may or may not be shared by the Emerge Radio Show staff. Follow us on Facebook. Search Emerge Radio Show on Instagram. Emerge the magazine.